So here's an example article about prostate, prostate cancer screening. In this article, the author is trying to report on something that changed in a recommendation provided by this group here, the United States Preventive Services Task Force. So I'm just going to read through this article a little bit, highlighting a couple of different things as if, uh, as if I were reading this, trying to understand what the author was saying. And then we'll talk about how to interpret an article like this. So in this type of article, the author will say, hey, here's the bit of news that I'm trying to talk about. Here's what happened recently. So in this case, this task force changed its recommendation on cancer screening from a D to a C. So D is don't do the screening, and C would be talk about it with your doctor. So then he addresses some concerns about this kind of change where he says, oh, it's a good thing that recommendations change over time. And then second, this change isn't as big a deal as you might think. And then he does a good thing, which is, he says, hey, who's making this recommendation? Who, who is this task force? So he tells you who it is. This task force is a bunch of primary care doctors and preventive medicine experts. Now, he doesn't really say if they're doctors or if they're PhDs or who they are. But he at least tells you who, who these people are, provides some website links. Um, you can look down at the bottom of this screen and see... Uh, let's see where the URL will take you. So these are all uh, New York Times links. Then he does another good thing, which is he talks about these recommendations, the A, B, C, and D. So he says that A recommendation means that it's an endorsement. Everybody needs to do this. And this is a great phrase here, high certainty of substantial benefit. And that's, that's a good way to talk about things in medicine as opposed to, oh, the surgery will definitely help you. So it sounds like you're cutting corners in what you're saying, but actually this is the most accurate way to say it. And then he goes on to say a B recommendation is similar, but only a high certainty of moderate net benefit. So the, that's another thing to point out with some of these authors. He thinks he's clarifying things, but even these sentences can be confusing. I mean, this is not the way we talk normally, as in we just normal people, non-doctors. So you won't necessarily read this and think, oh, that makes perfect sense. So you have to watch out for, there's still, there's still a fair amount of gobbledygook type language in these articles. And then he says a D recommendation is uh, advice that you not do, get the service because uh, there may be no net benefit or because the harms outweigh the benefits, which wouldn't be good. I think, yeah, okay. So then he gives a little bit of history about what, what this task force does, which I think is helpful. He tells a story about how it used to be a D recommendation because people could be harmed from overdiagnosis, which is a good thing to know. And he talks about some controversy that many people disagreed about the benefit to the screening. And then uh, he says that for a while it looked like the people that disagreed were right. Uh, but then some new research showed that there was some sort of benefit from the screening. And then he concludes that this meant that it was no longer true that there was no evidence of net benefits for screening and a D no longer applied. Then they changed its recommendation to a C 
The other good thing he says is that instead of saying, oh, this is clearly something you should do, he says, no, it's not really clear. The, there's moderate certainty that the overall benefit is small. So at least it's a benefit, but it is small. And then he says that signals to patients and physicians that they should make an individual decision based on patient preferences and circumstances. So essentially just talk about it with your doctor. So in some ways, this is a good thing that, that this task force doesn't go all the way over and to say, yes, you should basically, yes, you should definitely do this. It's not a totally black and white issue, which is the way reality is. So already, I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, no, oh, this task force is looking at this in a sober way. They're not over-recommending uh, one thing or the other, and they're not overly condemning something in a black and white way. So overall, this seems like a, a pretty good way to look at things. And then he tries to reassure the reader that you know, it's not bad that they're changing the recommendation. He says that when new evidence is found, it should be added to older evidence to change our thinking when appropriate. I agree with that. Then he goes into some statistics, which is important to know a little bit about when you're reading these articles and trying to decide how to interpret them. So he says, although there is now evidence of a benefit and its relative importance seems impressive, its absolute effects are not as persuasive. So he, he illustrates that by talking about the percentage of men that will benefit from uh, the cancer screening. And he, and he says, here, here are the chances of dying from prostate cancer over the next 10 to 15 years if you're a 55-year-old man. It's 0.6% chance of dying from prostate cancer. So if you apply the numbers that were in this study that he mentions earlier, that goes down to 0.5%. You're talking about going from 0.6% chance to 0.5% chance. So even though that's 20% reduction, it's only an absolute reduction of 0.1 percentage point, which is super tiny. So he goes into a lot more statistical information which I think is helpful to dig into. But for our purposes, it just points to the fact that this author is being very careful about how he analyzes this recommendation, which I think is very appropriate. So one of the best things he does here is he enlightens the reader about how these recommendations should be followed. And he says, there's still a large downside to the testing, and the ways in which we respond to positive screening should try to minimize interventions. Well, that's a little bit of technical lingo. I would say it differently if I were writing this article. I would say that there's, there can be downsides to testing because if you're tested and something turns up positive, you could get surgery or some other risky procedure as a result of that positive test, and that could cause harm to the patient. And so that's what he means when he says intervention. That could mean surgery or biopsy or something that has a risk. And so he says that the ways we respond to a positive screen, so if a patient gets a positive cancer screening test, we should say, oh, oh we need to carefully uh, evaluate how we're going to react to this. Are we going to take, him, take the person to surgery or do a biopsy? We have to be careful about that, which I think is wise. But if, if you click on an article or you're doing some research on a topic, that kind of thing may not be intuitively or naturally in your mind as you're reading opinions or headlines about different tests or different recommendations that come up. So that's why it's important to click through on these articles and read what the author's attitude about the recommendation is. You know, another thing to look at is 
who this article is written by. Now, this, if you scroll down to the bottom, it usually tells you who the author is. So he's a professor of pediatrics at the School of Medicine who is a blogger and makes videos. So at least you know he's a doctor. He's treated real patients. That might mean that he, so that's better than being just a reporter in some ways, although you can tell by some of the things I've said, he, he doesn't quite have the ability to simplify the terminology enough uh, to communicate at a level where most people can understand. So that would be the only disadvantage in having a doctor write this. But of course, you know, it's, it's better to have somebody who can at least interpret um, uh, a task force's recommendation about an issue because this person, this doctor has read journal articles and research articles and things like that. Now, the disadvantage is he's a professor of pediatrics. So why is he writing about prostate cancer? That's my only problem with this, uh, this article. And its author is, there's a mismatch there. So maybe they chose this guy because he's a blogger and he writes articles. And so they said, oh, well, can you write about prostate cancer? It really makes no sense. I, I don't know why they would pick him rather than picking a cancer doctor. So that, that's important to know. And so connected to that, one thing you might do is you might say, well, you know, this article is written by a, a, a pediatrician, not a cancer doctor. So I'm going to go back to Google and I'm going to do some searches for what cancer doctors say about this task force recommendation. And that's a good next step to take. So you could do that, uh, or you could um, even look up who treats prostate cancer. So you, know, you could go to go to Google and say who treats prostate cancer, and type that in. And so if you scroll down, this is a cancer.org article. It says urologists, surgeons who treat diseases of the urinary system, et cetera, et cetera, radiation oncologists. So you notice that pediatricians are not in there, right? So you could look for articles about that task force recommendation written by oncologists, written by urologists, uh, written by radiation oncologists, as opposed to the pediatrician article. Now, it might take you some digging to find that, but it might be a worthwhile thing to do.